Okay. So are you seeing a slide that says uh, New Family Law Act in BC? Yes. Perfect. Oh. Affirmative. <laughs> uh, lots of some folks are signing on right now, so we'll give it a couple more minutes. Is that all right with everyone? Sure. sure. Okay. It's uh, rainy here. You're not all in Vancouver, clearly, so uh, it's rainy here. Whereabouts are you? From? <coughs> I'm in Campbell River. All right, Campbell River. I'm calling in from Nelson, BC. Ah, I love Nelson. <laughs> Elmo. Okay, nice. Preston and snow. <laughs> no way, seriously? It's raining here. Here it is. Okay. No rain, no snow. <laughs> All right, shall I start? Yeah, or you can go ahead. Know. Just to let people know if you need to message us during the presentation, there's a screen on your left hand side. If you type at the bottom and enter, we can see it on the screen here. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And my name is Agnes Huang and I am a sole practitioner in Vancouver. I practice primarily in family law. I've been practicing family law for about uh, five years now. And uh, prior to January of this year, I was in a boutique family law firm called Schumann, Daltrip, Basner, and Robin. And as of January, I started my own practice. Uh, I share office space with four other people, and all of us do, well, family law and uh, child protection work. Uh, we do legal aid files as well. It's partly why I wanted to go on my own was to be able to do uh, more stuff related to social justice, which is my background, which I'll get to, to in a sec. So a couple of my colleagues, uh, Katrina Harry and Rhea Bailey, practice uh, strictly in, uh, primarily in child protection and and so forth. So my prior to law school, I I worked in the feminist community for uh, many years. Goes back a couple decades now. Um, I was the editor of Kinesis, which was a national feminist newspaper. So I worked at the Vancouver Status of Women. I was involved in refugee rights with the Chinese people in <coughs> 1999 through direct action against <coughs> refugee exploitation, or through uh, breaking the silence uh, in the downtown east side. And then I sort of realized as all the funding cuts uh, hit us all hard that, well, I should probably plan my career a little differently, and I wanted to be uh, able to advocate on behalf of women uh, in a different way, and so I went back to law school in 2002 and got called to the bar in 2007. So here I am now in terms of my activism. So I'm involved with West Coast Leaf, and uh, I'm involved in various other like fights against uh, to restore funding to legal aid and so forth. So that's a bit of who I am. And uh, I'm going to talk today about the new Family Law Act in BC and focusing on the parenting issues, dispute resolution, which you'll notice when I get to it is pretty short, and the protection orders. And in the new year, I think January 15, I think, something like that? January 18. 18 sorry, January 18, we'll be doing a uh, presentation on the financial issues, so child support and assets. Uh, and particularly for common law people under the new Family Law Act. And I know it may be a little difficult because we are on the phone and via a webinar, um, but I'm happy to take questions at any point along the way. I find that it's, you know, rather than trying to save it till the end, because you have no idea when I'm going to end actually anyway, uh, please feel free to either do it through the text chat or actually speak on the phone. Sometimes it's easier if you just say your question. Is that, so is that going to work for everyone? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And just a yeah. reminder, as uh, Kim had said, uh, this is being recorded uh, for the purpose of that after we're done, they will, the slides will go out and there will be a recording available. So um, let me go to my first slide, which is what the... So the parenting issues. Um, and maybe I can just... I'm sorry, is this a quick yes? How many of you have actually already either attended a, 
a, a seminar or, or have read the Family Law Act. How many of you are familiar with the new Family Law Act? I'm a little familiar with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is this, a, is this new for a lot of you? Yeah, completely new. Pretty okay. new. Okay, good. Okay, I just want to make sure. So Agnes, can I just stop for a second? You mentioned about a slide as though we're supposed to be able to see some slides somewhere. Yes. Are um, you online? Well, I tried to get online. I went to, uh, I thought I went to the right place. It's up now. I'm going to have Kim tell you uh, just a sec. Go ahead. Just, if you go back to the email that confirmed your registration and click on there, then you can find the link and oh. sign in with your email. All right. Um, dial in, web login. Oh, sorry, I have to go lower down there maybe. All right. And I sign in with my email and I'll get it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so all of you are advocates. So you're probably familiar generally that in well, British Columbia there's two sort of that two sort of legislative regimes that govern family law issues. The Divorce Act and then the currently the Family Relations Act and which will be the Family Law Act which will come into force next March, March 18, 2013. So the Divorce Act applies if you are married and also if your proceeding is happening in the Supreme Court. So if, even if you're married but you're proceeding in the Provincial Court, the Provincial Court judges can't apply the Divorce Act because uh, that's not within their jurisdiction to do so. So if you are, the parties are not married, and they're proceeding, so they're proce and they're proceeding either in the provincial court or the supreme court. Then it's the Family Relations Act, the provincial legislation that matters, not the Divorce Act. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I mention this is because you may be aware that um, the Divorce Act also covers custody, guardianship, and access, <laughs> and as does the Family Relations Act. Well, as of March 18, 2013, the Family Law Act won't have the words custody and access anymore, but the Divorce Act will still. So there is a lot of discussion as to uh, what, like how do you deal with the different legislative regimes? What language will you use in orders? And it will really depend on whether you're married and which court you're in. Because um, many of you may be familiar with the doctrine of paramountcy, which means federal legislation trumps provincial legislation. So there is going to be a little bit of a I think a transition as to, you know, you have a current order, you've been married, so you have custody and access language, and how does it translate now, now that we have new guardianship terms? What does that mean when you're going forward? Okay. So I will, I will talk a little bit about the transition in a bit, but um, I just wanted to put that out there, is that what I'm focused on is what will be in the Family Law Act. So it will apply to people who are not married, and if your proceeding is uh, in the provincial court. So, uh, the issues I'm going to talk about are guardianship, what they call parenting arrangements, which includes parenting responsibilities and parenting time, contact, and enforcement of parenting arrangements. Now, so maybe before I go on, um, parenting arrangements, so parent, parenting, parental responsibilities are what we probably, what you would understand now as sort of the guardianship responsibilities. And parenting time is uh, what you get if you are a guardian. Contact is what is probably equivalent, is equivalent to what we know now as access. You're an access parent if you don't have, you're not a guardian. So it's, there's a lot of the new language that changes, uh, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. So the next slide is on guardianship as well. So guardianship is the the key term, like in the Family Law Act, that's what is uh, touted as one of the biggest changes, is that uh, the provincial government has now done away with the words custody and access, and the word now is guardianship and contact. So parents are presumptively guardians while they live together and after separation, unless there's an agreement or order to the contrary. And parents, um, if you think about it, it means First of all, it means uh, biological parents. Uh, it doesn't mean a step parent necessarily unless there's an agreement. So uh, a parent is a biological parent, but also I don't know if you're all familiar with the fact that in this new legislation, in this legislation, there is new provisions called the about parentage, so that it accounts for 
children who are conceived through well, what we know as artificial insemination or what's that? Uh, assisted reproduction, right? So under the new law, it can be that a child has up to five parents. And the five parents are uh, the two intended parents, so the two people want to raise the child, plus a sperm donor, an egg donor, and the surrogate mother. So all five persons could be parents. So when the word parent comes up later in guardianship, you could have up to five parents. But generally, for our purposes, we're just going to talk about a parent as a biological parent. So, and I'm just going to be heterosexist here and just do it as the mother and the father. Um, certainly, there can be parents who are uh, same-sex couples, and I'm not discounting that at all. It's, it's just for ease, um, and it makes it easier for me to, uh, um, in some of my examples. <laughs> Some of my examples are about, uh, obviously, male violence against women. But um, so uh, parents, so back to the definition. So if you're living together as parents, so two, uh, the biological parents living together, and uh, after separation, they are presumptively the guardians of a child. If the parents have never lived together, but they have a child together, the parent who hasn't lived with the child is not the guardian, unless there's an agreement that that person is the guardian or if that person has been in regular care of the child. So if a, a woman and a man have a child and the father is sort of, you know, they've never lived together, he's around, he ever shows up every so often, um, it's, he's not a guardian unless he's regularly caring for the child. Now that might become an issue for us as advocates is, well, what does regular care mean? Is it once a week? Is it once a month? Is it a couple, you know, he comes for a couple hours a day, changes the diaper and so forth? Because, you know, you will note that being a guardian is extremely important. So it, it's important to be clear who is a guardian and who is not because guardianship is what gives the right to that parent, right? So it's going to be really critical. Um, and because, as the next part of the slide says, only guardians may have parental responsibilities and parenting time. And although I'm not dealing with it in this uh, presentation, only a guardian can stop the other guardian from moving. So if you are only a, a con what we call a contact parent, a contact person, you only have contact with the child, although you get notice when the guardian wants to move, you cannot stop the move. So that's why guardianship is important. The next part of the slide which says no more de facto custody and guardianship. And to me this is really critical for those of us who are av in advocacy right now. Um, under the current Family Relations Act, many of you may know, there's sort of a presumption, it's, it's section 27 and then section 34 about guardianship and, and custody. So let's say the parties split up and the child stays with the mother and the mother has sort of the day-to-day -day care of a child. Essentially, she becomes the de facto guardian of that child, right? And the same with custody. It's whoever has sort of the, where the child's primary residence is. That's who is the sort of de facto custodial parent. Now, this is when there's, there's no orders in place. And I don't know how many of you in your advocacy work has done this, but I've done this in my uh, legal work, is, is that if a woman comes to me and says, well, you know, my ex has taken off, you know, I don't want any contact with him anyway. Should I go and get an order for custody and guardianship? And right now, I, if I know that her ex is just going to leave and not really bother her, oftentimes I will, as my advice to her is to say, look, don't do anything. You will be the de facto custodial parent, de facto guardian, but unless you actually need an order, for example, the school or to get passports or something, don't do anything because if you start an application, you know he's going to make all these demands on you, right? And so, you know, I say, well, and e or at least let it lapse for a while. So you establish that you're the guardian for the next two years or something, and he does nothing. Because it'll be easier when you go to court and you're seeking these orders to say, well, he hasn't been around at all. I mean, he took off, right? I mean, I don't think that's uncommon in what we all do, yep. that, that that does happen. Well, <laughs> under the Family Law Act, the fact that he is, I'm going to assume that they were living together at some point. The fact that um, the, the bio dad takes off doesn't matter. He is the guardian. He is a guardian. There is no more de facto uh, 
the, the mother who has the child in her care is the guardian. All, all of a sudden, there is a guardian. The father is the guardian. And so unless the mother goes and gets an order otherwise, he is the guardian. And all the rights of guardianship kind of attach to that. So my concern with that is that it will then force women, particularly um, if they've left because of abusive situations, will have to then seek orders or do something to ensure that, that uh, they can either assert some sort of like sole guardianship or majority of the guardianship powers. Um, and, and that's something that, to be quite honest, I haven't heard a lot of discussion about in the family bar um, as to how, we, how we're going to deal with that. Um, as you know, many of you may know, a lot of the talk around the Family Law Act is, look, we're going to get away from litigation, use of the courts. It's going to be way more focused on alternate dispute resolution, right? I'm sure you've all heard that. that um, as, as lawyers, we have obligations to talk about mediation. You know, we all have to screen for family violence, which is, <coughs> is going to be a whole ish, another issue for lawyers. And they want more, like the first um, part two after the definitions is resolution of family law disputes. Out of court is preferred, right? Mm -hmm. But we all know how much, mu how much uh, mediation costs money, right? All kinds of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms don't exist uh, easily, right? The courts themselves don't do a lot of, uh, have extra resources for judicial case conferences or, or family case conferences or judicial settlement conferences. So people are going to have to, they're going to be forced into sort of private settings where, uh, you know, a mediator will charge the same rate, uh, a lawyer mediator will charge the same rate they charge as a litigator. So you're talking about 250 300 an hour sometimes. And so it's not going to be, uh, unfortunately, very cost not going to be possible for a lot of uh, women uh, leaving abusive situations to be able to access these uh, alternative dispute resolutions. And frankly, I think that the courts are going to want to push people towards that because, you know, the court resources are strapped as it is. And if they can say, hey, you know, you should try to resolve this on your own, um, they're going to push them out into some sort of alternate dispute resolution when, when none really exists. Mm -hmm. Recently, I was talking to, um, I forget his last name, his name is Michael, but he's in charge of the family justice counselors down here in the Lower Mainland. And, and I was asking him whether there's any more resources for the family justice counselors. And, um, and he says he's, there's nothing, right? And those are really, you know, that's who often we look to to be sort of the mediators um, because they, it is a service offered through the Attorney General. And I'm not sure, I mean, many of you are outside of the Lower Mainland, but even to get what we know as the custody and access report, the Section 15 report, um, through a family justice counselor here in Vancouver still takes about a year. And I know, uh, I'm not sure how many of you in your regions actually have family justice counselors easily available uh, to you. We do. You do? Uh, where are you? Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, I think the, so the resourcing is a huge issue. And I, I sort of do this up front because I think it's, because um, <laughs> it's quite funny, the legislation is like, I don't know, you know, you, they think you write it in and then it will happen, right? So we write in that we want, you know, we prefer resolutions out of court, so then therefore it's going to happen like that. Mm -hmm. um, they write agreements before orders, and so what people are going to come to agreements wait much more. I mean, um, anyway, I, I'm a little skeptical, to be quite honest, that, that it's going to be that easy. I think there's a lot of changes in the legislation that will require um, determinations by the court as to what any of this means. It's going to be hard for people to figure out how to negotiate these, let, al you know, let alone there's not necessarily the resources. So um, as I said, one of the big things I think will come up a lot for us as advocates is the, the doing away with the de facto custody and guardianship. I think that that will um, lead to women, I, and I don't know, I mean, I. I did a talk, uh, a talk recently at the provincial training conference. Just a, well, it was on mobility, but I, was, you know, I, I don't know whether or not, for example, the schools or hostels will now say, wait, wait, wait. You know, the new law talks about guardians, and the guardians are any parent, both parents, right? Well, where's the other parent? Where's the other guardian? And I'm not sure yet whether or not. Um, I mean, I think they're, they'll be aware of that, and whether or not they will seek that. I recently was looking at. Uh, the passport issue, and I don't know if you've ever, 
you know, we always assume that if you had sole custody, you could get a passport. But it, I was, somebody had done a paper recently, and the passport office seems to take the position that if, even if you have sole custody, but the other parent has specified access, they want that parent's signature. Mm -hmm. So whatever you decide in court, I mean, you know, the, author, the other agencies won't necessarily um, not honor, it's not that they don't honor the agreement, but they, that it's different for them. They take a different position, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the thing is I'm not really, sh it, it, it's going to be unclear what's going to happen. So for women who've had no orders for now in custody and access, you know, because the guy's been away for 10 years now, I mean, are they going to be forced in a position where, well, you're going to have to go get an order? And it's not necessarily that they won't get the order for sole guard or for guardianship, you know, sole guardianship or however they're going to term it. It's just that then they're going to have to do it. They're going to have to try to serve their ex. Um, they're going to have to go to court and get the resource and, and make the case, and who knows what he'll say at that point, right? So that's one of my concerns about this new legislation is that it's, it, it is, there are certain parts of it that just force women, will force women into having to, to get court orders, which means they'll force them into the court. Um, so the next, um, that's, that's the guardianship issue. And I don't know if there's any questions about that. I should stop for a moment. Okay. Well, I'll move on to, so parenting arrangements. So uh, I'll, Parenting arrangements are parenting responsibilities and parenting time. That's the that's definition. And I'll get to the, each of those in a second, but the New Family Law Act says that, now, th now these are new things. These aren't part of the current Family Relations Act. So the Family Law Act says that informal parenting arrangements, um, if there's sort of a normal routine for the child, then Guardian cannot change that routine without consulting with the other guardian unless the consultation is unreasonable or inappropriate. Now, unreasonable, of course, is that if there's a history of family, if there's, family, there's violence, right? Or inappropriate could be that that parent is no, nowhere around. Okay. But um, as uh, I'm sure you've already dealt with now about it's difficult to sometimes to convince the court that family violence, the violence against women exists, mm -hmm. and that's real in effect. And the reality is, um, you've got a routine for a little bit. There's a history of violence in the relationship. Now we're two years out of the relationship. There's little contact, but certainly that pattern of abuse hasn't gone away, or the, and the woman hasn't, uh, the the mother or the woman hasn't really been able to. I'm not saying get over, but you know, like deal, like that, that, that violence is still a part of her being, right? The history of violence from this man is part of her being. So it, does, it doesn't matter that he's not there in her life, you know, hitting her every day. His mere existence often will trigger for her um, that history, right? So I'm concerned, like, if the court says, well, you know, there. The reality is men can behave for a period of time. So how, how long, you know, if, 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 if it's sort of quiet for about a year or two, is the court going to say, well, it's not unreasonable for you to negotiate or to discuss, right? <coughs> um, but that doesn't mean that that pattern of abuse is gone. We all know that. Mm -hmm. So that would be one of my concerns. And, you know, when I get to protection orders, you may note that in the new protection order legislation, there to expire in one year unless the court orders otherwise, which I think is quite problematic. But that's what I mean. There's this whole notion that uh, it's going to be, it may take women having to go to court to convince the court that, well, it would be unreasonable for me to talk to this guy about changing the routine or so forth. So um, this is where the court can make orders to allocate uh, parenting responsibilities and parenting time and for the parties to participate in dispute resolution and for the implementation of a parenting order. Now, I wanted to get back to this parties to participate in dispute resolution. Um, under the new law, uh, lawyers will have an obligation to essentially vet for family violence. I mean, there's going to be a box that we have to tick off. It's pretty much to say whether or not we think that it's appropriate that a dispute resolution be an option for the parties based on family violence. And um, at the, 
last uh, uh, session I did with the Jane Doe Project last week, a woman, uh, somebody, uh, an advocate asked, you know, what are lawyers doing to about this? Like, what's our discussion? And we haven't, I haven't heard any discussion about this issue, so I've raised it with um, some of my colleagues through the Trial Lawyers Association of BC, the Family Law Group, about look, we should do something about it. Because, I mean, I'm somebody who's worked in the feminist movement for some time, but I don't know. Um, all, I'm not. You meet with a woman like briefly, mm-hmm. and I'm her, I'm a lawyer as well, and she may or may not disclose to me. So what am I to do? Like, I mean, what if I find out, I tick the box that, oh, I don't think there's something. I mean, how am I to determine that uh, in a short, you know, hour or two meeting with her before I uh, prepare all the notice of family claim or the application to obtain an order, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and the other thing is, actually, one of the ethical issues that um, I said we need to talk about as lawyers is, what if our client is the one who's abusive? Mm You know, can I tick a box that says I don't think family, you know, dispute resolution is appropriate? I mean, one, there's obviously solicitor-client privilege. Um, but what, you know, what is my obligation, right? Anyway, so it's a, it's, it's a big issue for us as lawyers, and please, uh, I, I'm saying this to you only that uh, it's in my mind, and I'm going to make it in the mind of other lawyers, that this is important for us to be able to figure out, mm-hmm. that it's an, a really important issue. Because I, I, my concern is that the courts... And, and lawyers would be all too happy to kind of shove things out of the court and into alternative dispute resolution, and it's totally inappropriate, right? Um, we know the dynamics of how violence against women works, mm-hmm. and it doesn't, you know, and I think lots of, lots of lawyers don't. And so they think, well, as long as he's not beating the crap out of you, well, it do, there's no more violence, right? It used to be a long time ago that the court wouldn't give joint custody to families that couldn't work together. But now you're seeing the judges giving that all the time. And Mm -hmm. same problem, women can't deal with these men because of the power and control issues. They're being forced to, but they can't do it. Right. Um, Thank you. Tracy, are you there, Tracy? Yes, that's me. Oh, that's you. Okay. Maybe can you you put a chat out? That's quite interesting. So about the family justice counselors not wanting to mediate? Mm Mm-hmm. But where where are you, Tracy? Um, I'm in Invermere, so we use Cranbrook. Okay. Um, tell me, can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, well, really, that that is our um, that is basically our only mediation service, but it's limited. It's it's limited. Yes, it's limited because they won't deal with those relationships. Yep. Okay. It's the same with um, the Nelson area. Right. Um, we have one family justice counselor who actually ha- takes on the whole area, and that's not just Nelson, that's Salmo and Castlegar and, you know, all of that area contained. And so one huge caseload, and two, um, a stipulation that there has to be no violence in the relationship to make a referral. Right. And But who determines whether there's violence in the relationship? Uh, like I is guess it whoever's the referring party. <laughs> okay. And it, and as long as one person says there's violence, if the other side says no, there isn't, and they they won't do the mediation. As it doesn't necessarily even have to be violence, though, does it? I mean, it could just be power and control issues where she doesn't have a voice, mm-hmm. and well, he, she's intimidated by him because for her to be in the same room with him and be intimidated by him, she's not going to speak up. This is Valtor in Invermere. I also work with uh, clients in our area. And, um, like, our counselor, justice counselor, is Joanne Smith. And, um, like, she does take couples where there is power and control issues. And um, she often checks back with us, like with uh, whoever is counseling the woman. Mm. And um, we discuss it with the woman and see how comfortable she feels and and how she can see this fit. So, you know, and depending on that, we make a collaborative decision. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, did anyone else have some experience around mediation and in their area? Or, okay. So um, we, we'll come back to talk about dispute resolution a bit more. Um, 
as I was saying about the parenting arrangements, so one of the things the court can do is also make uh, orders regarding like exchanges or supervised access. So the court has some, it, you know, oftentimes you'll say, well, the exchange has to happen, you know, in public, uh, or there has to be a third party there, um, or supervised access can be in place. So uh, I'm not sure about your experience outside the Lower Mainland, but in the low, he, even here in Vancouver, there are very few uh, options for supervised. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, one a couple agencies. Uh, the cost is still quite significant. Uh, the initial intakes are usually about sixty dollars, and then for each hour, it's about forty dollars an hour. And to get a report from them, it's about twenty-five dollars. And I, people often ask, uh, even who does supervision? And there's not very uh, many super. Uh, agencies who will do it or individuals who will do it here in the Lower Mainland even. So I'm not sure if, if, in, if anyone can uh, briefly say whether in your area it's easy enough to get a supervisor for access. No, it's not in the Campbell River area, yeah. not at all. No. And I'm in the Cowichan area and it's not here either. Yeah. And I'm in Burns Lake. This is Catherine McLaughlin, and um, there's nothing here either. Our, our clients have to go to Prince George. Yeah. So, I mean, are you fine? And sometimes the court will then say, well, I'm, there has to be some parenting, right? Some access. So, if there's no supervision, you know, and unless so, unless it crosses over where the child is actually in danger of physical harm or abduction. Mm -hmm. My sense that that the courts will order there to be access, unless you know, of course, if the ministry is involved or there's other, um, for example, peace bonds or, or criminal proceedings going on. But the courts are pressing that look, there has to be some parenting time. Is that your sense of everything going on? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that you know that that is also um, anyway. Even, so sometimes what I'm saying is that even though the court can make such orders. Um, it, it's um, unless they can actually be realized, they don't really. Unfortunately, women are going to find themselves in a difficult position of of either agreeing to allow supervision to not happening, or just say, well, as long as it's in public place and so forth. So um, it, it again comes down to a resourcing issue. And I see Janet's got a question, but can I'll, if you don't mind, Janet, I'll come back to that um, in a little bit. So the next thing is the parenting parental responsibilities. And this is what we often know is, you know, I don't know if most of you are probably familiar with what we call the Joyce model of guardianship. It's about decision making. Hmm. Okay. Is it oh, sir. I'm sorry, uh, sorry. I, I'm just having to I just did something wrong to somebody. Give me one second. Uh I've never done this chat while talking thing, so I'm a little rusty. I apologize for that. Um. Yep. I did the wrong. Thing. Okay. Um, so the Joyce model is really a, it's it's the guardianship, it's the decision making provisions, right? It's really about health. Uh, general welfare, religion, and education, those big decisions about kids' lives. And what we often talk about at custody has been like the day-to-day -day decisions. So essentially under the Family Law Act, it's all been merged together. So under this uh, title, Parental Responsibilities. It's, and there's a list in Section 41 of the, um, of the uh, Family Law Act. It's basically making the day-to-day -day decisions. And I'm going to go to that uh, section just so you can see it on this slide. The day-to-day -day decisions affecting the child, where the child will reside, with whom the child will reside and live with and associate, child's education, extracurricular activities, cultural, linguistic, and spiritual upbringing and heritage, medical, dental, other health-related treatments, applying for passport, license, permit, benefit, or privilege for a child, giving or refusing consent, receiving notice entitled by law, requesting information from a third party, starting or defending a proceeding involving a child, or exercising any other responsibilities reasonably necessary to nurture the child's development. So it's a really long list now. 
And what will happen is that the court can either do the general joint guardianship kind of like basically both parties make can make decisions on these issues. Um, if they don't agree, they do mediation, or if they don't agree, perhaps one per parent gets to make the final decision. That's what we have currently under what we call the Joyce model. What I think you'll find is that the court will say, like the, the first one, the day-to-day -day decisions affecting the child. Generally what happens now, I'm sure you know, is that um, whoever has a child in their care gets to decide what to do with the child. Unless that, you know, so um, if, you, if you have your child with you and you're, you know, your ex can't tell you what kind of dinner to feed your child, unless of course you're feeding your child something that the child's allergic to and you're doing something to harm the child, right? But essentially, when the child's with you, the, the presumption is you know, you decide, you're the parent who gets to decide things about the child, bedtime, you know, what things that friends they see and all that kind of stuff. Well, here there's this longer list where you're going to get orders that basically delineate who will have the responsibility or who will have the final say. So education, uh, that could be the same as in the Joyce model, like you know, parties will consult with each other and if one party uh, if the parties don't agree, then you know the the primary resident parent or something like that has the final decision. Uh, applying for passports, I talked about this earlier. They may be much more specific about uh, who has to sign the passport, and that that will be something that for when it's important, right? If if your ex is never is a you know even though maybe around and maybe the guardian, but isn't around or isn't that cooperative, um, you may not want to have your ex the ex be the one, the father be the one to have to sign anything or give consent at schools, for example, right? You know, your child, the child wants to go to a field trip and it shouldn't, and if the mother has to always try to track down the father and get him to sign the consent form, I mean, that's a bit of a pain. And if he's not really cooperative or doesn't even show up, you know, when he says he will. Um, so these are the types of things that the court can put together. So this is the mix of the custody and guardianship issues. Uh, a big one, I don't know, it's a weird one where it says the with whom a child will live with and associate. Mm -hmm. Kind of a weird one because it, what does that mean? If I don't like your new partner, I can tell you. <laughs> you have to break up with that person? I don't know. I'm not quite clear what that one will mean. It's a bit, I, I don't, it's a bit odd. But the where a child will reside, of course, is what we've called the mobility provisions, right? And um, it, you know, and that can be like whether you move out of, uh, uh, is, is it, um, or is it, you know, what kind of housing that the child lives in? It could be as, as much as that. So I think some of these terms, although I think they're trying to be a little more specific about various areas where there's decisions to be made about a child, it can uh, open up for a lot of abuse, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. That's my concern about some of this stuff. Um, it allows, if, particularly if the courts sort of do a generic, well, let's be joint, and if you don't agree, you do this, right? It's, it's just a lot of the, I have a client and her ex is such a, a jerk and, you know, it's about daycare and he keeps peppering her and it's just like, you know, he keeps harassing her about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so that's my concern is that, that this list, although maybe it's better that it's a little more spelled out than the general, you know, religion, education, health, and, gen and welfare, that, um, that uh, it could lead to more grounds for abuse. So as advocates, and Jan, you're saying some of the things we should tell them is like, you know, you have to think now as you're doing your orders that this Family Law Act will come into force in March. So you want to, even if you start proceedings now, you may not have decisions or you may not go to court or have orders until after March. I mean, right now in Vancouver, you can't schedule trials until pretty much after March now anyway. So this is the law that will apply. And so you want to kind of think about, well, much more than just saying generally we'll have sole guardian or joint guardian. Are there things, are there particular aspects here that could, that your client may agree that, okay, could be, should be a joint decision, but other ones that she wants to preserve solely for herself because she knows that's going to be a site of harassment and abuse, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Um, what about access to children's counsel, counseling? Hi, Janet. Janet, you got great questions. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, counseling, absolutely. Um, Sometimes, you know, it, I don't, outside of the, I don't know if there's, there's much free counseling outside of when the Ministry of Children, Family, and Development are involved, right? They're really, uh, even in the Lower Mainland, uh, maybe Kim can 
as your experience with that there's any free a um, lot of counseling? Some of the nonprofit organizations and the children who witness abuse programs have counseling. Yes, we do. But that's limited too. Right. The time time limits on that. Right. And maybe uh, is is that your experience uh, outside of the Lower Mainland? Like, are there children who witness abuse counseling? Stopping the violence. Stopping the violence counseling. Yes. Much of that. <coughs> what yes? our our experience. Uh, this is Nadine in Coucher Valley. Our Hello. experience with that, and I suspect it applies across the province, is that first of all, it's waitlisted to get in, right? And that can be quite a long time before you get um, any one to one. Uh, option with that, and then of course there is well certainly for the children CWWA staff, children who witness abuse, it's time limited, and they're also limited in what their how their you know there there are limits in how one is to what one can cover in that time or how one can respond within with, within sessions and those kind of things. So yes, it's it's available and it's free, but there's some real challenges to accessing it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And again, it's it's like everything we talk about. I I, I know all the um, anti-violence organizations get with us and so forth. So even within our community, there's fewer and fewer resources. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Janet again has asked whether or not a woman uh, women should tell or request their, that their lawyer uh, tell her say that she wants to have a trial if the guardians can't agreement. And the reality is. Because of, the, of this whole de facto custody and guardian, you, you will need, a, need some orders in place. So if the parties, uh, the guardians can't come to an agreement, I think you are going to, women are going to be in a situation that they're going to have to have some sort of trial. And you know, I, I, I always joke because I have this t-shirt that says I'm litigious by nature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the t-shirt doesn't really fit me right now, but uh, I'm hoping by March 18th I can uh, lose a bit around my girth and I will wear it again. But, and I joke because it's, um, I, I mean, I certainly tried to mediate and resolve things out of court, but it's not that easy. I mean, when you're dealing with somebody on their side who is, let's be kind and say unreasonable mm -hmm. versus what I'd usually say, I mean, you're not going to come to an agreement or you're not going to come to an agreement that, um, that, for example, your client, the woman, the mother, I mean, she may compromise a lot. And, and, and even if you have an agreement, as you know, they, they go sideways within, I mean, I've seen things go sideways within a week. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. You think you have an agreement, and then there's, I mean, you can't cover everything in an agreement. You can't cover everything in a court order. Like, things happen, right? Mm -hmm. Parenting is, as somebody said, is messy. Like, things, you know, things happen with kids, and it's like, well, oh, yeah, who's going to, who is supposed to do this, right? Who gets to decide, um, you know, whether or not, um, my daughter uh, takes swimming lessons versus soccer on this particular day. They conflict, right? Oh shoot, we forgot to, you know, deal with that, right? And 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 sometimes when you're dealing with abusive men, it's it's any anything that they can find to target the woman, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to have, uh, apart from the fact that it's hard to reach agreements when one party is abusive. It's also even when you do have agreements, um, they they find ways to to still abuse, you know, to 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 rear that ugly head again of abuse, right? Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I think that you're going to end up in trial. Even the best mediators, there, there's, even the best mediators, you know, there's just going to be so, so many gaps that still exist. Um, we're going to come to it in, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm jumping to my slides, but do any of you have experience with parenting coordinators? No. 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 Okay. No. I mean, do they? Do you have parenting coordinators in your region? No. 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 That we know of. Okay. Well, this is one of the big things in also the Family Law Act, right? Is this use of parenting coordinators? And a parenting coordinator is supposed to be somebody who's trained, and and essentially you have to have either an agreement or an order regarding parenting arrangements, right? And then the parenting coordinator sort of helps the parties really implement it. So, you know, really, for example, if you are having a struggle over your holiday, you know, you're scheduling your holiday time, mm -hmm. rather than running, going back to court and having to get the court to try to decide, you have a parenting coordinator to try to help you do this. Well, first of all, there are very few people that are sort of trained to be parenting coordinators. Secondly, they're not cheap. They cost about the same as, you know, mediators. 
Um, some of them are, are lawyers, some are, are psychologists, all you know, very well experienced. But you know, again, they're, they charge in the range of two, three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars an hour, right? They usually ask for um, a retainer of five thousand dollars, right? Wow. So, and the family justice counselors won't be trained to be parents. They, they're not going to be parenting coordinators, right? Mm -hmm. So the court can say can direct the parties to use a parenting coordinator. But if you have no money or resources, mm -hmm. then how? And and you know you have another side. I mean, this is women tell me this all the time. They don't want their ex just racking up the bill by calling the parenting coordinator and you know email email because they have to pay for half the bill, mm -hmm. right? So it's not necess again the parenting coordinator under the new law will be actually be able to make uh, binding decisions on the parties around the implementation of a parenting agreement. But again, it becomes it's a resource issue. So, um, so that's that. Uh, let's go to back to sort of parenting, the parenting arrangements for a second. Just yes. So here, guardians. The last one. Guardians must exercise parental responsibilities in the best interest of the child. I mean, and you you know that 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 term gets bandied around a lot. Best interest of the child. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll come to that definition and. I'm sure you've already had experience about what's in the best interest of the child in trying to deal with that. So um, there is much more of a focus, I think, in this legislation that parties are supposed to try to cooperate with each other. I mean, there's always that caveat that they talk about, well, family violence is the thing that, you know, that makes it uh, uh, unreasonable for there to be cooperation or consultation, right? <coughs> but as uh, all of you know, um, how the courts or how you know the evidence around family law, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. What will be considered, what will, I guess, cross that threshold of what is family violence, right? Um, so let's continue on on uh, here, for example. Oh, yes. This is what I was saying about what the uh, guardians must exercise parental responses in consultation with other guardians unless agreement or order says the contrary and unless consultation would be unreasonable or inappropriate. And the parental responsibilities may be allocated among the guardians by agreement or order, and it doesn't need to be shared. And this is what we're talking about. Like somebody could be responsible for education, the other for health. One could get to decide the passport issue and so forth. But um, now, now think about those are all the things that you have to negotiate. That whole, that whole list that we saw under Section 41, that's a pretty big list of things to try to negotiate. And there's probably lots more. You know, it's going to get down to really nitty gritty. Who, who determines what kind of clothing the child wears? I don't know. I, I, it can get like that is, is, is the concern. So again, um, what is unreasonable and inappropriate? The issues of family violence, the violence, violence against women, the dynamics, the uh, one guardian isn't really around or cooperative. Um, are you going to get somebody in mediation to admit or that they are violent or they are an ass? I, probably not, right? <laughs> this is what I mean. You'll end up in court. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and um, you know, it just means I'll have a job for a lot longer. But it makes your I I don't I you know I I. Have great respect for all of you. I think this is this legislation is going to make your work a lot more. Mm -hmm. I already have enough trouble reading all this. Um, parenting time. So parenting time is, uh, you know, what we call sort of access right now, but um, as for a guardian. So only a guardian can have parenting time. And here it is. It says, during parenting time, a guardian may exercise day-to-day -day decisions affecting the child, again, unless there's agreement or order that is otherwise. So sometimes, for example, one parent won't believe in, for example, a certain types of health care, right? So won't give their child their asthma medication because they don't believe in Western medicine or something like that, right? So there may have to be an order that, you know, Dad, you will give your ch this child his asthma medication because he needs it, right? Um, but otherwise, as we said, I said earlier that the, the guardian gets to decide what they do with their child when that child's in that guardian's care. So there's supposed to be no presumptions. Um, so 
there's no particular presumption about what's in the child's best interest. So it's not a presumption that the responsibility should be allocated equally or that parenting time should be shared equally or decisions should be separate or together, right? No presumptions, right? But as I can't remember who said it earlier, essentially there's, a sh there's been quite the push towards joint, joint decision making, right? Mm -hmm. So even though there's no presumption, like quote unquote no presumption, the reality is a lot of courts will press you towards making joint decisions. They don't, more and more, unless there's real evidence to, for the court to say this is why the parties can't essentially cooperate with each other, work together, and it's clear that it's, let's say dad is the one who is, is the one who's being asked in all this, that the courts, a lot of courts will say, well, you know, it's the goal is to have people co-parent, right? Work mm -hmm. together. So in some way there is, it's not necessarily a bias, I don't know if it's a bias, but there's um, a whole a notion that both parents should, should parent, guardians should parent together, or there should be a, an involvement, right, with both parents. So I think in some way, even though there's legisla the legislation says there's no presumptions, we've already shifted towards that. Mm -hmm. So in a way that there is a presumption about uh, parties should sort of try to work together, and that is important, you know, in the Divorce Act, of course, it says that um, there's maxim the principle of maximum contact, which has, even though it's not in this legislation, it's still part of how uh, it's considered that it's important, for example, for a child's emotional and, and development and, and, and growth to have um, a strong relationship with both parents, right? So in some way, I think that there is a shift towards there being some presumption. I, I, I don't think telling the courts or telling um, mediators that there should be no presumption means that 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 um, the the move is the move towards joint everything isn't still there. I think that's what is happening. I, I mean, lots of people, men in particular, still think that the mother always wins, always, and that's really not what I think going on. It's my experience of that. Um, contact. Contact is what we know as access. So contact is time for somebody who is not the guardian of a child, and, and including people other than parents. So generally, grandparents, for example, or an aunt or uncle, they're the contact parents. And um, agreements are only for contact are only binding if both of the guardians agree that there should be contact. And then again, orders for contact can have terms about uh, and conditions, supervision requirements, et cetera. So it could be, the, it's like the situation we have now where um, let's say the mother has sole custody, sole guardianship, then the father would be the, what, what now we call the access parent, the contact parent. And just so you know in terms of how the legislation sort of transitions over, uh, there's a transition provision that, so if you currently have an order for custody or guardianship at all, custody or guardianship, under the family law, you're considered a guardian of the child. If you only have, an, if you have an order and agreement that only gives, uh, let's say, the dad access, then that dad is only a contact parent now and is not a guardian. Th those have to be in place. Now, as I said to you, if there's nothing in place, the dad is going to be a guardian. Under the, it just trans that's how it transitions over. So in some way, it would be good if you can get those orders right now for sole custody and sole guardianship. Um, denial of parenting time. So what can the do court do? Uh, this is a question. If uh, a parent withholds, the, so the mother withholds the child from the father, the court can look at this, require parties to participate in dispute resolution, attend counseling, can order make-up time, reimburse expenses, or pay, up, pay a fine, right? or order that there be supervision on transfers. Now, so the court now has some powers to basically sanction a parent for not allowing access to occur, parenting time to occur. But where the denial of that access is not wrongful is if that parent has a reasonable belief that the child might suffer family violence, drugs, there's drugs or alcohol, oops, missing something there, um, the child is ill, or there's a repeated failure to exercise parenting time uh, by the other parent, 
right? So if if the and then this often happens, you know, men go and they get these orders and they're like, yay, I get the child every every weekend and then never show up. Mm-hmm. And so the mother is left scrambling, right? Never knowing whether he'll show up or not. And I have a situation like that, and we need to we're trying to change the order because she doesn't want to be in a position where all of a sudden he shows up and with the and with the police with the quarter saying now I want to see the children even though he hasn't seen the children for eight months, right? Mm-hmm. So. Um, <clears throat> So it's, but again, the issue will be how do you prove that drugs or alcohol are involved <coughs> currently, right? How do you prove that there might be family mm-hmm. violence? Um, so the, uh, the mother is at risk of being found to have improperly withheld the child and could be su- sanctioned. It could be beyond makeup time. It could be fines. It could be reimbursing expenses. Now, the parent who doesn't come, who's a, who doesn't see the child, also can face similar remedies. So, because in the situation, for example, where um, you know the mother has to work and the father doesn't show up to uh, take the children during his time, the mother then has to scramble and get, for example, pay for daycare. Right. <clears throat> so now, under the new law, and this doesn't exist now, the court can order, for example, that the father pay for the child care that was the additional child care and so forth. So that's a good, that's a good thing. Um, so everything, of course, turns on what's the best interest of the child. And uh, have, have you all had a chance to read some of these? Or are you familiar uh, with the, these new terms? So right now, you know, it's just under Section 24. And it just sort of generically talks about the best interest of the child. There's no definition in the legislation either in the Divorce Act or in the Family Relations Act. So now in the new law, there's going to be, there's an actual definition. And also, um, I forgot to put the, the first part, 37.1, it says that it's only the best interest of the child that must be considered. The law now is sort of, it's paramount. It's, you know, it's basically the most important thing. But now it's the only the best interest of the child. So you have to consider the child's health and emotional well-being, um, the child's views, unless inappropriate to consider them. Now, I'm going to come back to that one because that's really important. The nature and strength of relationships between the child and significant person. The history of the child's care, which is an important one too because... Um, okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Maybe that. So the history of the child's care and the, uh, the child's need for stability. These are important because oftentimes what happens, and I'll admit I, I have argued this, is that, you know, there, the mother has been the primary caregiver of the children throughout the entire relationship. And the court will say, or the other lawyer will say, look, yes, it's true, because that, you know, he, was a, he went out and worked, and you know, he'd come home, and she'd take care of everything, and, and they'd be together, and he'd see the children when he's back from work. Well, now we're broken up. It's a totally different regime, and you have to give dad the opportunity to be the caregiver, right? So the history of caregiving doesn't matter as much. I don't know if you've come across that, right? But sometimes the court is like, well, look, you know, but now you need to, it's, it's different now, right? They're not together anymore. So now dad has to be able to have that opportunity to show he can be a good dad and care, take care of the kids. Because there's no concern necessar- that he's necessarily harmful, right? So there has been, I think, more of a, a, di- a bit of a dismissing of the his child care as being important. So I think this is a good piece of the test that acknowledges that the history of the child care is important and keeping stability for the child, right? So that if, if, the, if the father's, you know, around every, you know, just because he works a lot, and you can't fault him because he has to take care of the family and so forth, but if it then diminishes <coughs> the mother's role by saying, well, so now we're in a totally different regime, so we're just going to flip things and put things to 50-50 because he's got to have, you know, be able to develop his relationship with the children. Well, that also disrupts the stability because the children are used to, you know, their main caregiver has is, is been the mother, she takes care of their day to day. She knows everything that they need to that needs to happen for them on a day to day. So at least these two provisions, I think, are good because there is an, at least a, an acknowledgement that uh, of the primary caregiver, where I think there's been a bit of a shift away from that in some of the decisions. Um, so the ability of a person who seeks, who is a guardian. Um, to exercise the parental responsibilities. How responsible are they? And one of the things, particularly when um, the children are very young, that I've argued is 
is when particularly the father has not actually cared for a young child, like the age of a child matters. Like you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about ages and stages, like how you take care of children to support their development at different ages of their lives. And so that uh, <coughs> come into this. So it's not just ability as in are they violent or an alcoholic, but just their, uh, their knowledge of caregiving, how open they are, for example, to taking parenting or so forth. Because lots of guys are like, oh, yeah, it's easy to take care of the child, right? Um, so that will be an important factor. And the ones that are highlighted are the family violence ones. And I'm coming back to that, those in a second. But I wanted to go back to B, which is about the child's views. Now, how many of you, <laughs> I, I get this question from parents, it's like, particularly dads, will say, okay, when my child is 12, he or she gets to decide who sh they live with, right? Do you ever hear that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as all, I'm sure you all know, there's no magic age. There's no magic age where a child gets to decide. The reality when children are about six, 15, 16 and up, they walk, you know, they, they talk with their feet. Is that what they call it? Talk with their feet. So if they don't want to be with you, they'll, they have bus passes, they'll take off, right? Mm -hmm. So the court is, as kids get older in that age, they do respect what they want and also they say, well, how am I, what am I, I'm not going to force a child to go stay with dad if, if she doesn't want to, right? What, am I, what are we going to put a police assist, like the police can go and pick her up and force her? You know, she's at that age, she'll decide, right? But when younger kids, um, that's a little more troubling for, I think, the courts and for lawyers to figure out, like, how do you get their views in? Now, this, I think, is, it's important that lots of times, you know, kids' views are considered, but the difficulty with this definition, the, where it says, or the, factor that the child's views essentially must be considered unless inappropriate to consider them is how do you get the child's views before the court or out to the mediator, for example, right? Mm -hmm. What the court hates, <laughs> I mean, it's difficult, is that you have the competing affidavits, right? Mm -hmm. Mom says this, that the child says this. Dad says this is what the child says, right? So how is the court supposed to decide? So what are your options about getting the child's views out? Well, you know, we know there's a Section 15 report, which will be now Section 211 in the new Family Law Act. But as all of us know, that costs a fair bit of money, right? And you don't necessarily have people readily available in your community who can do them. Or you have one person and you think that person is full of crap, right? And so you would never ask, you would never want that person, that psychologist or somebody, to do it. Um, so now, then, there's other ways, the views of the child's report. Well, those still run in the range of 1000 to $2,000, right? This is, sorry, I'm telling you if you're doing a private retainer. I, some of the family justice counselors can do views of the child's report. Or just, and, but a child's views is, I recently uh, was talking to a couple of psychologists about how they do them. And, and they, they don't uh, assess anything. All they do is they they ask the question to the child about, tell me your view, like who do you want to live with or something like that. They don't assess whether or not um, what they think that the best parenting arrangement should be. They, their role is just to take the child's views down. And the only thing they kind of try to screen for is whether they believe that there was some undue influence by one of the parents. Right? But in, a, let's say, a one hour or even half an hour kind of session with a child, you don't necessarily get that. So views of the child don't always work that well in getting what the best interest of the child is. So according to the new Family Law Act, you're really going to have to consider the child's views, right? Um, unless it's inappropriate. And inappropriate is often their age, their maturity. So uh, I note that we're at, <laughs> I better run along because I haven't even gotten to protection orders, sorry. Um, does anyone have, the, the ones G, H, and then I and J, these are all related to the family violence um, provisions, right? Now the courts or mediators are supposed to consider more the impact of family violence and who's responsible for that family violence and um, the appropriateness of, of um, arrangements that could ensure like safety for the child. And of course, consider whether there are civil or criminal proceedings related to child safety. And uh, when I was doing the session last Friday, someone was saying that in, it seems, it's like, for example, in Burnaby and Surrey that the RCMP are charging more and more women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, it's going to become an, 
I mean, it's good, I think, that family violence is named, but how it will play out is another reality of what it will mean is um, it, it remains to be seen, I think, and for all of us as advocates. I, I know there's some um, work on regulations uh, around family violence and how to screen for family violence and how to train, uh, for example, mediators, parenting coordinators, or lawyers around family violence, but no, it's, it's, it's a big one, and I, and I know this is probably a big area for us, but I think I can't really talk much about it just because of the timing. And I'm, you know, I think all of us, it's something that we could talk about in a whole other session, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably going to jump over it unless you really want to talk about it. No, I think it's something that we know. I know, that's what, that's what I mean. I'm totally respectful of that. I'm well aware you all know that, right? Yeah. There, there is like provisions here about how to assess for family violence, right? The Section 38, nature, seriousness, frequency, well, pattern, you know. But, you know, that's, you can have these words, but um, how are you going to train a lawyer or judges or mediators to actually know what these mean? That's the big thing. Mm -hmm. So um, this I mentioned about the transition where there's existing orders or agreements. So I'm going to jump over that. Dispute resolution I won't say too much about because, you know, mostly it is about a resourcing issue. Yes, there is an encouragement to resolve disputes other than through the courts. But if there's no resources, how will it become real? And if it's, you know, if it's another grounds for um, the abuse to continue, how useful is it, right? Um, parenting coordinators I talked about. So protection orders, um, this is what, oh, sorry, did anyone have questions up to this point? And I'll just, then I'm just finishing up with protection orders. I was just wondering if these notes will be available. Uh, the slides, the slides are will be available as well as the recording. I think. Yeah, we're going to try to merge them. They'll be available next week. Great. And uh, protection orders. So uh, this replaces what we now know as the restraining order. I think you probably all know the section 37, 38, and 126 of the Family Relations Act. Those are sort of where you get the general. Um, restraining order provisions. So now will be protection orders. And it's a, this is an interesting thing. It may be applied for by a party or a person on behalf of the party on the court's own initiative and may be brought independent of litigation. Now that last bit I'm going to talk about for independent of litigation is good because some, a lot of times, for example, when a woman's leaving an abusive situation or is not sure, right, how many of us have clients who are just, they're not sure they want the relationship to end, but they need some protection in the meantime, right? Mm -hmm. They don't know if they want to, for example, file for divorce or seek custody. You know, they're not, sh because they may not, they're not there yet, right? I have clients yeah. who are like, they're not there yet. But in the meantime, we want something, they need something in place to protect themselves. So this allows you to not, for example, you don't have to start the application to obtain an order in provincial court or the notice of family claim in Supreme Court in order to then, with all the you know custody issues, child support, whatever, in order to seek a protection order. You can just apply for the protection order. Yes. That's a new thing and it's an important thing. Um, and it, this is kind of a funny one where it may be applied for by a party, uh, you know, like the woman herself, or a person on behalf of the party. So we were talking about that at our last session is whether or not, for example, as advocates you can apply. Um, then again, you always have to get the woman's affidavit. And I mean, none of us would apply, I think, for a woman a protection order unless she wanted it because it exposes her. It doesn't expose us. Like, it puts her in further danger, right? Mm -hmm. um, the question, for example, could the ministry apply, the Ministry of Children and Family Development, could MCFD apply on behalf of a woman if they feel like, look, there needs to be a protection order in place? And so they can be kind of like the big bad third party out here applying for the protection order. So that might be a question to, to explore. So that does, you know, it's, it, it's about trying to um, protect the woman but not put her in a position where she's exposed, right? Because, you know, any time there's a report to the ministry, whether it's done by third party, the man always thinks it's the, the woman who's done it, right? Mm -hmm. they, they always think it's, oh, you, you know, you reported me to the ministry, even if it was a third party. So it may be that there could be a way to safeguard women a bit more, as much as we can, um, if somebody else, a third party, can apply for the protection order on her behalf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I'm not quite sure. So yeah, so orders can, this is, I mean, it's, uh, as you might know, the current restraining order is sort of very general about, you know, not not show up at somebody's house or not talk to or indirectly or directly contact and so forth. So there's a bit more sort of definitions around restraints on communications, attending or entering at a place, following the person's possession weapons. Um, there could be directions to the police to remove persons from property, which is important because lots of times, I'm sure maybe you've seen the restraining order, there are police police assist clause provisions, right? Mm -hmm. But I know many women say that the police don't necessarily enforce them. Uh, so there could be an, in the order a specific, for example, if he shows up, you get, you take him away. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It, again, the police can say, well, we don't have the resources to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but And this is the key I think I talked about on the bottom, where it says it expires in a year unless there's an order otherwise. Mm -hmm. Right now, restraining orders basically are indefinite, right? And Well, sometimes they, they'll have a, if they're ex parte, they'll say, somebody can come back and try to set them aside within two days notice or something. But generally they just continue, right? Mm -hmm. Well this is that the presumption is you have to make sure if, that you ask for an order to go further than a year. And the danger, of course, is the court may say, uh, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm just going to put a year and, you know, if anything kind of continues, come back in a year, right? Mm -hmm. And as you, we had all talked about, men can behave for a period of time. And a year is not a long time. And so, you know, and particularly if there's litigation going on, I mean, there's no reason for the man to come. But in, you know within one year something might happen again. And that may then not be grounds to get another protection order. But that abuse may still continue. So it may not be physical abuse, but it could be, you know, the harassing emails, the, um, you know, my comments, right? The, my tires are slashed, but I can't prove it, right? So there ha you as, as an advocate, you really need to ensure for, if there's a lawyer, if you're going in, that, 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 they, that the protection orders be indefinite or longer than a year, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And my concern would be that the courts are going to more default to, well, a year is good and then, then we'll see, right? Which all, all that means is that a woman will have to go back to court in a year versus knowing, you know, and I know every time, I'm, I'm sure you do, like I when there's like the, the reconnaissance orders, the criminal ones, mm -hmm. when that year is coming up to an end, it's really distressing, right? Mm -hmm. And the courts are, and the criminal, in the criminal courts, you know, when the as long as nothing has happened in that year, the Crown can't extend it, right? That's my concern with these protection orders, is that there's going to be some quiet, and women are going, you're going to get in your 11th month, and, and, and it's going to be really distressing. And these things expire. So I think that's um, something that we all need to know about. And um, again, in making protection orders, the court will consider various risk factors, history of family violence, any family violence is repetitive or escalating, whether the psychological or emotional abuse constitutes um, a pattern, um, a current status of the relationship between the family member and the at-risk family member, including any recent separation or intention to separate. And I'm not sure if, what this, if that one means, like for example, if parties are separating, we all know that that's the time where violence against women escalates, right? Mm -hmm. Or does it mean, as I was just kind of saying, you know, they've been apart for quite a long time. <laughs> so, and there hasn't really been a lot of incidents since. So uh, there's no need for a protection order. Um, and these are some of the things, right, like is it, you know, so a year from now when the protection order is about to expire um, and there hasn't been much contact because of the protection order, does that mean that there's no more escalating violence or there's no, or the history is gone now? And on top of that, how do you prove a pattern? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, process, of, okay. I'll come back to that, Jan. Um, Janet asked about whether... Uh, an enforcement clause that has to be made or is it assumed. The difficulty with enforcement under the new protection orders, as you know, there's, been, there's a civil enforcement. Essentially, there can, I think it probably will be the same as under the new, uh, under the current restraining order where there'll be what we call a police assist clause, mm -hmm. um, where it says that um, if so-and-so breaches, that the police can take that person away and can hold them. 
the thing is that now if you breach a protection order, the only remedy is under the criminal code. It's not a civil remedy of contempt. You now it's not a breach under the civil procedure. You, you, so basically it will require, it's supposed to be more serious, except it will require to, the Crown to actually find that there's been a breach of the protection order. And the Crown, I'm sure you know, I mean, they're under-resourced and they're not also necessarily sympathetic. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be difficult for women. Um, and I, I'm not going to have much time. And Janet, at some point if you want to talk to me directly about some of your questions, I'm, or any of you, I'm happy to talk to you about some questions, right? Mm -hmm. um, Kim, we can send you out my email, or I don't know if you have it already. I can answer any of your questions uh, outside of this uh, forum. Mm -hmm. um, that would be good, I think. Yeah, I'm happy to chat with any of you. Yes, I would, if there's some place that your email can be put up for us, that mm -hmm. would be um, helpful, I think, Agnes. Okay, sure, yeah, I can do that. I am happy to do that. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes. So then, so it, um, and any uh, protection orders, these are another risk factors. So, um, and it's also risk factor against uh, somebody, another family member in the home, right? Mm -hmm. So it, the, it's, it's a little broader than just how it is currently about you know, the other parent or, or the children. So it could be a grandmother in the home, for example, mm -hmm. or another partner in the home. Um, and, and it says, yes, now the at-risk family member's perceptions of her, his, his or her own risk, <laughs> his risk. Um, I, I recognize the language is gender neutral, mm -hmm. right? And that's been an issue for those of us who are advocates. Um, but um, so perception by that person is supposed to be considered and uh, vulnerabilities such as pregnancy, age, family circumstances, health, economic dependence. Um, I think immigration status should come into that. Obviously, so these are the at-risk factors that the courts are supposed to consider. When, um, but think about you know if you're the one trying to get a protection order, are you, you know, the evidence that you have to gather in order to satisfy whether whether there should be a protection order. Um, so the courts are supposed to consider what I call the realities of family violence. Even though the language is gender neutral, the court's supposed to consider whether to make the order against one person only, taking into account the history or potential of history of potential for family violence, the extent of the injuries or harm, and their respective vulnerabilities. And the person who initiates an incident of family violence is not necessarily the person against whom the order should be made. And the court may make an order regardless of whether a family member has complied with the previous, or there's one that uh, the fam at risk family member is in a shelter or a safe house, so supposedly protected, right? Mm -hmm. There can still be protection orders, whether or not there are criminal charges, because sometimes it's like, well, you know, you didn't charge them criminally, so there's clearly it didn't happen, right? right. Or if the at risk family member has a history of going back, um, because we know certainly oftentimes women will return, right? I mean, it, it takes some time for women to get to a place where they can actually leave their abuser, right? Not to mention have the actual um, stuff in, in place to, to be able to move forward. Absolutely. Like housing and... Yeah. You know, um, and yeah. 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 So the court's supposed to... I mean, this is, I suppose, yeah. good. The court... I mean, so th these are supposedly the things they say, yes, you know, family violence is gendered. It is primarily violence against women, and the court should take these things into account. Because I don't know how many of you um, in your, that women get pressured into doing, well, mutual restraining orders, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like, you're, you know, look, you don't want to see them anyway, so just agree to it. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the harm? Well, the harm is that constitutes an acknowledgement that perhaps you're just as violent as he is, right? Or you're part of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. When it's not the case. But, um, and I, I, I'm very opposed to mutual anything be, unless, unless it, I don't think there's a prejudice to my client on that. But I, oftentimes there is, right? Mm -hmm. Because even though the parties consent, there's, it, it, it constitutes like some acknowledgement, well, yeah, yeah, we'll just both stay away from each other. Well, no, my client doesn't need a restraining order. My client doesn't do these things. Mm -hmm. so I'm not going to agree to them. 
But, um, some, but a lot of times, you know, it's the easiest way to get the restraining order against the other party, right? So, I mean, because I can't guarantee, for example, that the other that a restraining order will be uh, granted against the husband. So maybe I say to my client, well, if you agree to both of you having one, then at least you'll be protected, right? It's a horrible situation to be in for the woman, right? Mm -hmm. So hopefully that will that the um, you know the I don't I don't know I mean that that should be taken into account in these realities, and also this yes that person who initiates the incident you know that's the self defense one. Man says, yeah, but she threw something at me. She threw a teddy bear at me, right? Mm -hmm. I, somebody said that once. Somebody threw a teddy, uh, at the last session, threw a teddy bear and was charged with assault. Mm -hmm. um, and many of you, you know, have been around like I have in the 90s. Remember that general social science survey that talked about, like, th uh, you know, women were just as equally as violent as men mm -hmm. because they put, you know, women throwing things. Mm -hmm. It was, like, equal, except that it was women throwing, like, a tea towel versus a man throwing a knife, but it was still throwing. Anyway, um, so hopefully that will take into account whether or not if there's a pattern found that and a woman has to respond to protect herself, even though she has to start, she quote unquote started something, um, that it shouldn't be grounds to find that she is the perpetrator of family violence, right? Um, will this PP, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, Janet, you and I should talk. <laughs> So protection orders, yes, they can be longer than um, a year. The question is whether the, what I was saying is whether the courts will do that or whether they'll think, well, you know, really start with a year and then come back in a year and see if you still need one, right? So when the, when the protection order is in relation to a child, the court also has to, there's a child, um, has to consider whether the child may be exposed to family violence And so that's, you know, at least there's an acknowledgement, I think it's already there, that, <clears throat> it's that there's harm to witness violence, right? Violence or abuse. Mm -hmm. So that's just putting it into the legislature. I think there is at least some acknowledgement in most courts, or by most people, that in fact children witnessing violence against their parents, their mother, for example, is, is still um, something that needs to be stopped. To um, and this is my last... So restraining orders, oh, I hit my last one. Restraining orders that are made under the old, the FRA, those particular sections, they'll remain in force in accordance with the terms of the order. So, you know, really get a restraining order now because they generally won't have time frames on it. They will just continue on. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm not sure if right now, for example, if lawyers are saying, look, you know, under the new family law, the, the protection orders will have a year, so let's put a time limit on it. Hopefully they're not wise to that time limit and just try to get them now. Mm -hmm. But they'll just carry on. And, and, you know, they get registered with the protection order registry, uh, the restraining orders do, and the same will be the case with the new protection orders. But I, I spoke to somebody in the protection order registry, and they're quite aware that there, is a time, there are these time limits, right? Mm -hmm. So it... If uh, Janet, you're saying like they will expire unless they say otherwise, right? So you can you can go all in, and you've got to make sure that whoever goes in or the lawyer, or whatever, knows that you have to uh, when when the new law comes into place, puts in a provision puts in a provision that is either not it doesn't expire mm -hmm. because otherwise it will just expire in a year, and the protection order registry will have probably in their note you know, one year from this day, look at it again to see if it's been renewed, and if it's not, it's struck, right? Mm -hmm. um, is a protection order going to be easy to get? I don't know. Is it, uh, the test seems, I don't know if, <clears throat> I don't know right now. Right now, sometimes people say it's easy to get, it's relatively easy to get a restraining order because the court will usually, because it's usually on a without notice application, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody goes in, um, without the other party knowing. And what the court will often do is put it in place but give the other party the opportunity to bring an application to set aside that order within, say, two days' notice. And so sometimes the other party does and sometimes they don't. Sometimes criminal proceedings happen. Um, now, I'm not sure. You can still obviously get protection orders on a without notice basis, but whether the courts are going to be much, do much more scrutiny around such protection orders based on all these factors, saying, well, show me all these factors. Like, try to, you know, make sure, you, you know, what factors are you falling into? 
And so I'm not sure, Janet, the question is, are they easy to get, is whether or not they're going to be more difficult than restraining orders. I wish I could answer that. I don't have the crystal ball. I mean, that's my thing about this new legislation is that there's a lot of really fundamental changes. And I'm not saying change is bad. It's just I think most of us, as we don't know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. So it, we will likely be in a situation where there's going to be a lot of, I mean, it's going to be hard to advise clients. I already have a hard time trying to think about how to advise clients on what they should do. Should they start something now? Should they wait till the Family Law Act? You know, um, and I think you're going to all be in that same position. So if I can help in any way to ease your burden, I shall do that. Anyway, I, I know we're at almost 4.30, so if, does anyone have any sort of last comments or questions? I don't know. I think it's Joyce and it's Selmo. I'm, I'm just a little bit confused in that um, the, the change sure. and the, I guess the assumption is to lighten the load for the um, system and at the same time, I'm seeing us running to court more and more and more, and I'm running, you know, going and and trying to find services that aren't even <laughs> aren't even there. So I'm not sure what the the reasoning behind it is. I think we have to call Shirley Bond. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know either. Like I I agree that it it there's there's parts here where. I, I had done a talk separately on mobility, which I haven't done uh, for for you folks today because it's a it's a topic in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But there's certain parts where it's sort of like you know, um, you you basically have to go to court to say, hey, it's unre to to convince the court that it's unreasonable for me to try to give notice to the other side, right? Mm -hmm. That says the court can give you an exemption, right? Mm -hmm. So that means what? You have to go to court to get that exemption. Right, and and I'm thinking that, you know, the reasoning behind it is that they want to open up the court process a little bit more and, and not have it so bogged down, and yet here we're being told we have to keep going to court for every little thing. Yeah, I, I think there's going to be more and more. Uh, I think it's going to lead to more litigation, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. that, that if you, you know, now, you know, like saying, like, yeah, I'm just going to kind of coast along. I have my child with me. My ex has gone away. I don't care. Oh, shit. I have a gar new, another guardian, right? Mm -hmm. i got to get an order. What if the school says, well, where's the other guardian now? Exactly. The law says there's two of you, right? Yeah. Oh. And I don't know, as I said, I don't know what the schools or the hospital or, the, you know, anyone's passport agencies, but, you know, passport agencies, for sure, you need mm -hmm. orders, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're very specific of what they want. Yeah. So it, it, you're not going to get an agreement. You're going to be in court. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, so anyway, thank you all. Oh, thank I you. really appreciate all your questions uh, on audio and uh, on the chat. And uh, we will, uh, as I said, I'll uh, pass on my email to Kim. Mm -hmm. That would Questions? be great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much, Agnes. I'm just uh, one quick comment that I'm noticing is that when I first read over the simplified version, the, the layperson's <laughs> information mm -hmm. that I looked at a month ago or whatever it was, I thought, oh, good, this looks like I like it's really designed to support domestic, you know, families that are have domestic violence. Um, in them and make it make it more protective for them. But as you've gone through your things today, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, it's made it far worse. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways is that I also really like the idea that there can be an order made that somebody can't keep coming back to court. And yet now, when I, and I'm thinking, well, often abusive men will do that. They'll keep mm -hmm. yanking their ex-spouses back into court just to make it hard on them. Um, and yet uh, the way, again, you've explained it today, it's making it look like that could actually backfire on women. Mm -hmm. because there's so many reasons that they might need to come to court, and yet then they're going to get slammed with not coming back, yeah. being told that they can't come back. Yeah. And in lots of places, for example, the courts don't sit every day. Oh, mm -hmm. heavens no. Right? No. So, you know, you're waiting months to have to yeah. deal yeah. with little things yeah. and being harassed and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th there are certainly provisions that stop the men from, you know, like what we call the vexatious litigant. But it's a pretty... They have to do a lot before the court will sort of deny them their quote unquote right to uh, access have, the courts, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. really. It's yeah. 
Yeah, and that's that's my concern. I mean, it's and hopefully it won't. I mean, I you know this the level. I, I hope I I want to be optimistic that you know maybe this will help clarify a whole bunch of things. I'm just concerned it just gives more grounds for uh, I think what, more abusive. What I see, and it's Joyce again from Salmo, um, is that. This is all well and good and wonderful for the going on that presumption that this is a you know a usual family and there it's it's you know splitting up and things need to be taken care of, but when you look at it from the you know the women the abused women stance, this is just another tool right. that that's being given to the abuser to beat the victim with. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a concern with. Even, you know, talking about family violence is gender neutral. It means that men go, yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah, she's abusive to me. She's, you know, mm-hmm. emotionally abusive, and she does this, and, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. family, you got to consider me in this yeah. equation. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it comes down to a lot, like, I mean, how, how many decades have we been trying to educate society, police, yeah. <laughs> courts on family violence? Yes. It in the putting some language it does hasn't cha- won't change anything. Yeah. Yep. So, well, thank you, Agnes, for your insights and your information. And hopefully, we'll be able to get you know your email. And if anything comes up, it's wonderful that you are so willing to kind of be there for the rest of us too. <laughs> I shall try to do that. Yeah, I appreciate that for one. Yeah. Thank you all. all right. It was uh, wonderful to meet you all on the uh, on this uh, web. Hello seminar. Take good care. Yeah, thank thank you. you, Agnes. Okay. Thank right. you, Bye-bye. Agnes. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Please stand by.